Great. Hello and welcome to, the, to today's webinar, Commodities for Change. Thank you so much for taking time out to be with us today. I'd like to welcome all who are joining the live event and also those who will be watching the video on demand today. I am Nanda Boss and will be your host for the hour in today. So I'd like to speak to us about a couple of things before we get started. I love the statement that says, questions unlock doors that were previously remain closed. Questions unlock doors that would previously remain closed. So with that said, I'd love to encourage our participation today. We will be running a live Q&A session at the end of the webinar after all of our speakers speak. So we've enabled the question, ask a question feature. You'll find that at the bottom of your screen. So you are more than welcome to pop your questions in there and I'll ensure to take them at the end and let our presenters take the podium and answer. If we don't get to everything today in the hour, within the hour, we will we promise to send out a recording for you to watch on demand. I'd also like to remind us all that the information provided at this webinar is for information purposes and does not constitute any offer or solicitation. It's just recommendation from our side as investment products or services. The statements made at this webinar may contain forward-looking expectations, which may be based on current views of Grace One and the speakers that have been invited by us. As always, please bear in mind that investments may go up or down and should always be considered within the context of each investor's personal circumstances and the understanding of the risks, risks involved. There are no guarantees and the facts presented at the web webinar may be corrected or referred to in the future. So consider this as we talk and go through our total investment strategy. I'd also like to just introduce some of the speakers we have today. I know that the three gentlemen that are here bring to the table a total of 65 years worth of investment experience. By name, we have Nils Jensen, Managing Partner and Chief Investment Officer at Absolute Return Partners in the UK. We have Duncan Theron, who's the Chief, Chief Executive Officer at Grace One, and we have Robert, one of our Senior Investment Analysts. And I'd really like to take time to read Niels's bio so we understand who's speaking to us today. Niels has over 30 years of investment banking and investment management experience. He began his career in Copenhagen in 1984 before moving to London in 1986. In 1989, he joined Goldman Sachs and became co-head of its US equity business in Europe in 1992. Post he, the post he held until 1996 where he joined Oppenheimer to manage its European business. In 1999, he rejoined the Lehman Brothers, now in charge of the European Wealth Management. In 2006, he was appointed director of Trafalgar House Trustees Limited, advising one of UK's leading corporate pension funds in investment strategies. Niels founded Absolute Return Partners, as you would see his background there on the screen, in 2002 and is now Managing Partner and Chief Investment Officer. So we are very pri privileged and honored to have him with us here today. Niels, thank you for your time. It is always a pleasure to see your face and hear your voice. I've been meaning to catch up with you, but Maybe you can tell us before you get started how it's going in Denmark. I believe you've moved home, you're back in Denmark. Is there a sense of normalcy with regards to COVID? What is happening in your world? And as you set up your screen, talk to us. Well, um, I, I, I still have one foot in the UK and one foot in Denmark, but I am, I am in Denmark right now. and will stay in Denmark for, for the rest of the summer before I go back to the UK. Uh, um, um, the UK and Denmark are two different animals when it comes to the approach of, of COVID. 
Um, Denmark is more or less back to normal. Um, on public transport, you still have to wear a face mask. If you go into your doctor to into a hospital, you have to, have to wear a face mask. But other than that, it's more or less back to normal. If you go to a restaurant, uh, you have to you have to bring your COVID so-called COVID passport. You have to prove that you have been vaccinated. Uh, but other than that, it's it's business as normal. In wow, the UK, I didn't expect that. In the UK, it's the UK is further behind. The problem with the UK relative to Denmark is it's a more complex country with far more people of different ethnic backgrounds. And um, the UK have struggled to, um, to persuade certain ethnicities to get vaccinated. And therefore far in, 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 the, in the Muslim community, for example, in, 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 in England, a very low percentage of people have been vaccinated. And that's coming back and biting them now. Um, we have more, more than 40,000 new cases every day in the UK. And uh, it's, it's not getting out of control, but it's definitely not as good as Boris Johnson likes it to be because he wants to reopen the economy. But I think he's smoking dope. I, think, I don't think the country is ready to be reopened, uh, given the, uh, the last number of new cases every day. Wow, you're welcome to share your screen, but I hear you and I think we are experiencing the same here in South Africa and the broad, broader Africa in that there has a lot to do with more education to inform people because our senior citizens have also been very resistant, but good news our you know our more 35 to 49 plus have taken up have been registering have been vaccinating so I know it's we're going to move faster than um, we were previously. That's good to hear, Niels. You welcome here and we're very excited to hear from you today. Niels is going to be talking to us about and asking a key question, as we say, questions unlock doors that were previously closed. Are we on the verge of a new commodity super cycle? Over to you, Niels. Thank you, Mandy. And uh, let me just double check that you can see my screen in front of you right now. Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, my presentation, I could, I could talk for hours about this because it's a very complex and very big issue. But I'll try and keep it to about 15 minutes. Um, as you can see here on page two, uh, I have no less than six parts to my presentation, um, which basically means I've got about two minutes for each of them. So let's get started straight away. What is a commodity super cycle? Um, let me see if I can get this right. Here we go. A commodity super cycle is a term uh, used. It's it's not a it's not a, 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 a set definition. I mean, different people use the term differently. But most people, when they talk about commodity super cycles, they think of it as a longer term, a long-standing bull market, typically uh, over several decades, um, and uh, obviously. Uh, it's it is if it runs over several decades, it can be very powerful. Uh, Janice Henderson have done some very interesting work on commodity super cycles, and they have found that since 1795, so over the last 225 years, we have been through six uh, so-called super cycles. Um, the other interesting thing about commodity super cycles is that. They often they don't always coincide with a peak inflation, but often they do. And I'll show you a chart on the next page that shows exactly how it works. If you look at this chart on page five, the orange line in the middle is a uh, an image of commodity prices over the last two hundred and twenty five years. And as you can see, uh, commodity prices. It was the first, the first super cycle was around the Napoleon Wars in 1814. The second one was around the US Civil War in 1864. The third one was just after the end of World War I in 1920. The fourth one uh, was after the Second World War in the late 1940s. Um, the fifth one was uh, around the second oil crisis in 1980. Uh, 
also on this chart, it's coincided with, as you can see, with the Cold War. And then the final peak in commodity prices was uh, just before the, uh, the global financial crisis in the summer of 2008. But as you can also see, look at the red dots at the top of this chart. As you can see, four of those six super cycles in the last 225 years coincided with a peak in inflation. Uh, only the um, super cycle uh, peak in, in around 1950 and the super cycle peak around 2008 uh, did not coincide with a, uh, with a peak in inflation. The blue dots at the bottom of this chart is uh, exactly the opposite. It's a trough in, uh, in commodity prices. And as you can see on the extreme right-hand side of this chart, Dennis Henderson expects the next peak in inflation to occur around 2045, which is still some 20, 25 years away. So even if we see a rapid increase in, uh, in, in commodity prices, uh, uh, at the moment, um, at least one of the most knowledgeable um, sort of um, commentators on commodities, uh, James Henderson, does not think it will result in a peak in inflation until uh, 2045. So let me move on to the second part of this presentation. Could, could this really be a super cycle? Is this really the real thing? And as you can see in this chart, commodity prices have outperformed virtually everything else uh, year to date. Outperformed equities, outperformed bonds, uh, outperformed pretty much everything. Um, as you can see on slide eight, um, most commodities are in a so-called deficit at the moment. When a commodity is in a deficit, it basically means that uh, demand outstrips supply and therefore, uh, you have to draw on your inventories to meet demand in order to get the market to balance. And it's, a, it's, it's not an absolute necessary condition, but it's still an important condition for commodity prices to rise for the markets to be in deficit. And as you can see on this slide, only cocoa of all the major commodities, uh, only cocoa is not in a deficit at the moment. On slide nine, you can see a a chart going all the way back to uh, 1900, so the last 120, uh, 120 years. And as you can see in this slide, if you look at the black line down at the bottom of this chart, you can see that the All Commodities Index is still trading below the, uh, the levels we saw 120 years uh, ago. In other words, commodities in general, when measured in real uh, prices, in real terms, are still cheaper today than they were 120 years ago. Only gold and oil are significantly more expensive in real terms today than they were 120 years ago. And on the next slide, page 10, you can see that even on a relative basis, this is uh, commodity prices measured against equity prices. And as you can see in this slide, uh, commodity prices are very, very cheap relative to equity prices. And this chart goes all the way back to the First uh, World War, around 19, 14, 15, 16, 17. And as you can see, commodity prices have never in that period, never been cheaper uh, than they are now relative to equities. So yes, one could argue that both on an absolute basis and on a relative basis, we are definitely uh, at, at the bottom, we're fishing at the bottom of the, of the pool, so to speak. And, uh, and, and, and that could be a very good argument why we are at the very early stages of a new super cycle. Um, let me switch to the next part of my presentation, um, copper prices, because I think copper is probably the most interesting uh, raw material that will benefit from the energy transition from fossil fuels to electrification. And as you can see on slide 12, copper prices uh, should benefit from a significant increase in demand from green, uh, from, from these new green energy forms. On this chart, you have a combination of electric vehicles, the gray part of this chart. You have wind, uh, the lighter blue part, 
and you have solar, the darker blue part. And as you can see over the next 10 years, there will be a five-fold increase in demand for copper from these industries. On page 13, you can see that, and this is another reason why I like copper so much, you can see that copper is now on the cusp of entering a significant deficit phase. In other words, copper demand is still not big enough to swallow all copper supplies, but that's going to change, uh, or could already have changed because we are in Q2, 21 right now. Um, we're actually in Q3, uh, but I haven't seen this chart was last updated uh, in January of this year. And I haven't seen a more recent update from Goldman Sachs, but whether we had just crossed the line or whether we're just about to cross the line, the point here is that there would be a significant uh, over demand for copper uh, relative to supply over the next few years. And on page 14, you can see what this means. This means that sometime in late 2022, according to Goldman Sachs, it's in September 2022, but give it an extra six months, I don't really care. Um, copper uh, inventories will have all been eaten up, will have been swallowed by uh, this strong demand for copper. And we will go into a uh, the next phase of the copper bull market where we have no stocks, no copper stocks to draw from. And this can only mean that copper prices will rise significantly. Copper supplies cannot rise for at least five, six, seven years, because that's how long it takes from the day that you decide to increase your mining capacity till the mining, till the mine actually goes live. And therefore we know that given the, uh, the current, current level of copper prices, copper miners have been uh, very specific on this issue. They say that copper prices, current copper prices do not justify adding to mining capacity. And we need to see copper prices at least 30 to 40% higher than today's levels before we will even consider adding to mining capacity, which basically means that we should go through a significant rise in copper prices over the next few years. The other reason, and this is a completely different reason, the other reason copper should be part of your portfolio is the, um, the, the attractive hedging uh, uh, sort of um, uh, terms that, that follow copper. Copper is the only major uh, metal that is consistently negatively correlated with bonds. In other words, if you expect inflation to rise, you should expect, and expect bond prices to fall. If bond prices fall, copper prices will most likely go up. In other words, you have the fundamental argument I talked about before, and you have the hedging argument. It protects your portfolio from rising inflation, uh, and therefore copper should be a significant part of your portfolio. Let me try to wrap this up quickly because I'm spending too much time here. Uh, other commodities to consider. Uh, this chart uh, we can go through very quickly. It just shows you how different how different raw materials, how different metals are exposed to different uh, power applications and other things. And you can look at this chart you will get. I'll make sure you get this presentation afterwards. So you can look at this chart at your own leisure. Uh, the only two raw, the only two metals that I'm not convinced about at this stage is zinc and steel. And the reason for those, uh, the reason is exactly the same for those two. Both of those two metals have significant uh, more supply coming on board over the next one, two, three years. And therefore, you need to be a little bit more careful with steel and zinc than you need to be with the other metals. Other things that I like, lithium. Uh, lithium is a big uh, material for electric vehicles. Even more importantly, it will be the biggest material when we convert to uh, fusion energy, which we will do over the next 10, 15 years. Fusion energy, as some of you will know, is also a nuclear uh, energy form, but it's fundamentally different 
from the nuclear energy that we have today, which is called fission energy. Fusion energy uses only two raw materials to make, to create energy. One is lithium, which is the fuel in the nuclear power plant, and the other raw material is water. And um, with icebergs melting all over the world, we have plenty of water. So using water and salt water, salt water is fine. It doesn't need to be fresh water. Um, we can use some of all that water that we get from, from the melting iceberg and melting glaciers around the world. Other fascinating uh, materials that belong in your portfolio, aluminum. Uh, aluminum is, um, uh, I think, potentially uh, going to replace lithium in electric vehicles longer term because it is, uh, you can charge your batteries much faster than you can with the existing technology. This is still early stage, but could uh, revolutionize uh, the charging time and the uh, durability time. I mean, um, you should be able to stay uh, using your phone and your electric vehicles up to three times longer without recharging than you can with the existing technology. Other interesting technologies uh, or metals, silver. Silver is much bigger. Silver is not just about hedging against inflation risk. Silver is big uh, when it comes to solar panels. It's very big in 5G and therefore silver should also be part of your portfolio. Graphene is probably my favorite uh, new technology of all new metals. Graphene is a byproduct of graphite and graphene has some fascinating application opportunities ahead of it. Uh, uranium, uh, if we are serious about uh, getting climate control under control, uh, whether uh, environmentalists like it or not, nuclear power is a must because you can only, you cannot face out fossil fuels if you only rely on wind and solar because wind, it doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always sound. And therefore, the two energy forms, wind and solar, are far too unreliable for, uh, for, for them to account for nearly 100% of the energy mix in our, in our power plants. And therefore, uranium needs to form the, or rather nuclear, needs to form the base. And uh, wind and solar should really only account for maybe 50 or 60% of, of the total energy mix, not 100%. And lastly, water. Water is, uh, is a big problem because uh, one of the negative implications of all this melting glacier stuff and all these, uh, uh, all these melting icebergs is that we turn fresh water into salt water and therefore access to fresh water is becoming a rising problem and water definitely belongs in tomorrow's commodity portfolio. The one thing you should not do when you invest in commodities is you should not invest in a plain vanilla ETF because up to 70% of all uh, ETFs uh, of, 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 of all the underlying raw materials in commodity ETFs is gold. And you don't necessarily want to be exposed in, to gold. You want to be exposed to tomorrow's um, commodities, those commodities that will benefit from the energy transition. If you just buy a plain vanilla ETFs, you get virtually nothing but gold. The other thing you should not do when you invest in commodities is to buy plain vanilla commodity uh, indices. As you can see in this chart, if you look at the gray uh, bars down at the bottom, you can see that fossil fuels account for a very significant percentage of almost all commodity indices. And therefore, um, and I know that both Robert and um, Duncan will talk about this afterwards, but the trick here is to invest in tomorrow's commodity, not in yesterday's commodity. Finally, uh, my conclusions. Um, number one, for commodity super cycle to be established, commodity prices must typically rally in tandem. And for that to happen, a catalyst is usually required. If you go back to 2008, at the peak of the last, Commodity super cycle. Uh, what was the what was the catalyst in two thousand and eight? It was China, the urbanization of China, the growing uh, industrial base in China that created a super cycle in commodities. Uh, the energy transition that we're going through right now, from away from fossil fuels uh, into uh, different energy forms, will 
technically speaking at least, will make it difficult to classify this as a super cycle because fossil fuels that account for such a big percentage of all commodities will probably be left behind. I cannot imagine that oil prices, gas prices and coal prices will rally over the next 10 years. Actually, my personal view is that in my lifetime, I'm now 62 and before I die, assuming I live at least another 25 years, um, I think both coal and gas and oil will go to zero or at least close to zero. I think I've covered the rest of the points here. Um, my bottom line is that maybe we're not in a traditional super cycle for the reasons I've just mentioned, but does it really matter? No, it doesn't matter as long as you buy the right commodities. And the other point is, as I mentioned earlier, commodities tend to be a very good hedge against inflation. As you can see in this slide, commodities are actually the best hedge you can find against inflation of anything. Better than gold, better than chips, better than bond, better than anything. That's it. I know that I've spent too much time, but I'm gonna wrap it up here by uh, passing back to Mandy. Thank you so much, Niels. That was perfect. You've given us the right context of where we are. And I know Duncan is available and ready now to take the conversation forward. So thank you so much. I'm going to ask you, Niels, to stay with us. I'm already seeing in our question box people putting in questions. So I'm looking forward to our Q&A at the end of the presentation. Thank but you so Nandy, much. That's, a, that's you, a good Duncan. reason to leave now, isn't it? <laughs> No, it's not. <laughs> uh, before you get started, Duncan, you can start sharing your, your screen. But ladies and gentlemen, a man who needs no introduction, really, Duncan Thron, over 23 years of investment experience. Love that prior to founding um, Grace One, he fulfilled the role of head of research at two of the largest local investment consulting companies and also acted as managing director and finally chief investment officer at Sunlam's offshore alternative asset management business. Duncan, I've always been a fan of how you present taking complex ideas and making them simple for lay people like us to understand. So I'm very excited to see what you bring to us today as we talk about commodities for change. Over to you. Yeah, well, thank you, Monday, for the introduction. And again, Niels, it's been uh, wonderful to just have you back on the show. Uh, Niels is um, our offshore partner out of the UK and now out of Denmark as well. And as you can see, Niels is a very well-informed investment decision maker. He loves to read, he loves to write. And um, Nanda, can I maybe just check that everybody can see the screen? Yes, wonderful. Thank yeah, you. Take okay, it away. Wonderful. Yeah, so I would like to recommend all the viewers to, to go to the Absolute Return Partners website and to go and engage with Niels and his team. You can do it in two ways. Firstly, you can sign up to the um, Absolute Return letter, which is very much an out-of-the-box, macro-thinking, thematic, mega-trend uh, thinking research sector. I mean, of late, uh, Niels wrote about Gencoin, which is a kind of a, maybe a first um, government-driven uh, cryptocurrency. He's written about how to construct your investment portfolios in an increasing interest rate environment. Uh, that uh, absolute return letter is free of charge, so you can just subscribe. And then also they have a, a, a paid subscription a research center called ARP Plus, uh, which you can also engage in. And um, I mean, of late, I've seen some of uh, the, the most recent, but very interesting reads. For example, thinking about thorium, um, hydrogen, water, and even about um, other cryptocurrencies. So please go and engage with them. Uh, some fascinating research. Niels has written a book. Uh, I've got it here with me. And he handed me the book in uh, May 2018. And in the book, he even said to me, he promises me you'll never uh, write a second book, but I think maybe a second one is, is coming. And in the book, the in, end of indexing, he writes, the investment world is changing and the lessons learned in the stupendous global bull market of the last 40 years will serve us very poorly in the years to come. And um, it's exactly for that reason 
that we have to start thinking differently. I would like to tell you that we've got um, three books for um, three uh, viewers. And um, if you can answer the simple question in which your absolute return was founded, and Nanda actually gave that um, answer away early on, we can just go and look at their website, then just drop Nanda an email and uh, we'll make sure um, the end of indexing is on your desks very, very soon. It's a fantastic read. I've read it three times and I think it'll make a big difference in your in your thinking. So I want to recap just on our previous webinar when we discussed uh, some of the megatrend thinking. And the first uh, thinking we put to the table was that we have to invest differently for the future. We cannot invest the way the world is. We have to invest the way the world is going to be. And I reflected on various themes or megatrends that played out historically. And every decade, there's something big that happens, some big idea. And 10 years post the idea, you really see the benefits of, of um, those themes playing out. And we all know how well, let's say, the NASDAQ, the FANG, and, and previously there's been some uh, commodity booms, as you can see there on the left, like the gold cycle. Uh, where, where to now? And I reflected on that we have to start thinking about all these new mega trends. And I showed the one very interesting slide from ARK Invest, and it talks about blockchain, genome sequencing, robotics, energy storage, and all these themes. And around a lot of these themes have we started to construct portfolios for our clients. Uh, the first one was launched about six or seven months ago. Um, our disruption equity portfolio is up about 25% in dollar terms. On that slide, you can see um, just the theme around energy storage. And, and that makes one think about commodities. And commodities must not be forgotten in the thinking going forward. And as you can see, we have constructed a global equity commodity portfolio. And we don't call it just a commodities portfolio. It's a commodities for change. Because we have to think about the next generation commodities those that focus on renewable energy, that focuses on energy storage, sustainable food, water. And maybe you'll um, raise an eyebrow when I say even cannabis. Uh, now on the disruption equity portfolio, as I mentioned that we've listed that on the Swiss Stock Exchange, it's live and you can invest it for a, as little as $100 into that portfolio. And underlying that one single share that you buy is a range of um, low cost ETFs, exchange traded funds that focuses on disruptive technology. But for today, um, I wanna spend just a little bit of time about our thinking around commodities and why our thinking is different. And I'm showing this one slide because if you receive an email from Grace One, well, yes, you'll see that we think thematically. But on the bottom of the email, you see this little logo called the PRI. Now that stands for the Principles of Responsible Investing. It is a global body of responsible investors that think about how to save the planet and how to invest in sustainable investments while making a difference to the planet and yielding superior returns for the clients. That's exactly what we do. And you can see the six principles on the right. And the first one is probably the most important. We will incorporate ESG issues, meaning environmental, social, and governance issues into our investment analysis and our decision-making process. Now, for our institutional clients, they've seen this over the last 10 years. They've seen how we incorporate ESG thinking. They've invested in ESG products. And they've seen that thinking this way yields superior returns and even at a lower cost. So it makes sense. You can yield better returns and be good for the planet and be responsible. We've incorporated exactly the same thinking for our private clients. And you'll even find ESG product in our model portfolios, even our unit trusts. And um, if you just go and look at the last 12 months, again, all those portfolios in the unit trust are again top quartile performers. But what we're doing right now is alongside our thematic mega trend thinking, specifically our offshore portfolios, we are again bringing in that ESG thinking. And that disruptive equity portfolio that has now been listed, that's been managed for six, seven months, that's done so well, has got an overriding ESG principle to it. There's, there's two major portfolios underlying the ETN that focuses on ESG. Now, the same with commodities. 
we need to think responsible and we need to think about sustainability. And you know, if you just go and look at uh, this research from the World Economic Forum, and I looked at the research of the last couple of years, the biggest risks going forward for the planet and for us as investors is extreme weather, is climate change. And I mean, you can speak to Niels about this as well. They're really focusing all their attention as absolute return partners on finding solutions for climate change, because this is a major risk. And if you're not going to take this seriously, well, you're going to feel the brunt of it because the world's changing and you're going to be stuck in stranded assets or old school thinking, old school commodities. And as Neil said, he thinks maybe in 25 years, old, some old school commodities can go to zero. So be very conscious of where the world's going because of climate change and this move to a greener economy. Now for us, we don't see that just as a risk. We see this as a major investment and business opportunity. And we want to invest alongside this major uh, wave that's happening and invest in the greener economy. Now, how do we do that? Well, if you go and look at the Paris Agreement, which was signed by more than 100 countries, uh, it's all about transitioning to a net zero carbon economy. So how can we do that? We have to reduce our carbon footprint or our carbon emissions by about 7% per annum to meet the target by the year 2050. And on the right hand side of the slide, you can see that most investment managers globally are taking this challenge very, very seriously, and they've signed up for the challenge. So if all these investment managers are signing up for the challenge, then I definitely think more managers and more investors are going to be selling out of old, out of old school thinking and investing in new school thinking. And if you want superior performance, you need to be a first mover. You need to move before the wave moves. And that wave's already starting. Um, and it's really started in March last year when COVID struck. Everybody uh, just suddenly became aware of that we have to be responsible and care about the planet. Here's one example, BlackRock. It's the biggest fund manager in the world. And Larry Fink, the CEO last year in his um, annual newsletter to their clients, noted that they are going to start moving out of old school commodities and, and all the bad stuff, the coal type assets. And you can see on the right hand side, they currently have $87.3 billion of assets invested in fossil fuels, just in their listed funds. Now, $87 billion, if you equate that to RANDs at around, let's say, 14 Rand 50 today, it's about 1.2 trillion RANDs. And this is just one fund manager. Now, think about if a lot of fund managers start moving, the old school assets may see a reduction in price. And the new school assets or the new school thinking will see this wave and we need to be first well neil sh showed this slide and i think it's one of the most important slides and robert's also going to talk to this is we then went and looked at what can you invest in and the world has got these four or five big major indices which everybody tracks and as neil said i mean those gray areas is old school energy it's not just gold there's a big chunk of that sitting in oil and, and if oil is going to zero in 25 years' time, is that where you want to be? Maybe in the short term, oil is very volatile. We've seen oil going to 75 and then dropping 6 or 7% in the last week. So maybe in the short term, there's still a space for, for oil. I'm talking short term, next two, three years. But in the medium to long term, you've got to start thinking about other assets. If you don't, well, just look at this quote from Ernest Hemingway. And we saw this happening in March 2020. The quote is, how do you go bankrupt? Well, two ways, gradually and then suddenly. And what happened in March 2020? Well, we saw two black swans. The first one was COVID and the stock market dropped 35%. Uh, the first 20% was in 19 days. It was the fastest, um, the fast and the furious ever. And secondly, oil prices went negative. The futures on the oil market went negative. It, the market's never seen this. So it just shows you how volatile um, some of these markets have become, especially commodities and especially oil. Now, you've got to move to where the world is moving, like I explained in that quote. And the world is moving to solar, winds, hydro, um, hydrogen, uh, lithium, 
um, you know, graphene, all these new type of commodities. I mean, I just see that if I look at what my friends are doing and what we're considering ourselves, um, putting in place um, renewable energy at our homes and, and our companies. So this is the move. Now, how do we tackle this problem? Well, what we did is we went and looked at all the offshore funds that we can invest in. And there's more than 56,000 in our database. It took us two years to build this database. Then we said, well, we want to invest cost effectively. We want to invest in exchange traded funds. And there's about 5,153 funds. We want to invest in the major currencies and we want to invest in funds that has at least got a, let's say, a three year track record. There are a few exceptions to the rule, but mostly three year track records. And some of these portfolios have got 10 years and longer track records. You just don't know about them. And um, we also screen versus certain search term matches and, and size of assets. And we don't want to pay more than about 75 basis points or 0.75 for an offshore investment. And if you invest today in the normal offshore unit trust, you'd be paying between one and a half and two and a half. And 90% of those actively managed funds cannot outperform the market. And then we devised a, quite an innovative way of ranking all these funds to get to a short list on which we did all the due diligence. And I just want to show you two snapshots of our process. And the one is after we've screened these 50 odd thousand funds and we get to a short list then we start using kind of an algorithmic approach of looking at certain search terms. Like, for example, here you can see I've just highlighted all the green ones. These are terms that relate to smart commodities. Look at the words there, hydrogen, lithium, renewables, rhodium, smart utilities, solar. So we try and match these words with the universe of investable opportunities, and then we screen them quantitatively and we do all the qualitative work. And there's a lot that goes into um, just our screening processes. We've created what we call a SWAN rating system. SWAN meaning, yes, the birds, yes, the gray swan, but a sleep well at night rating factor. And we try and find funds that rate a four or a five star rating. And that comes through all our qualitative um, due diligence. And finally, what we've done is we've created what we call a commodity for change portfolio. Um, it's already uh, off the ground. We have investors in it. And um, today is really our first time that we openly talking to you um, about this opportunity. And all that we're doing, if you look at this analogy, is we, we're not reinventing it, the world. We're simply looking at the way things have been done. And I mean, that Nokia old phone was a great phone. I mean, it never breaks. Um, and it just keeps on going. But you've got to adapt. And we're just saying that you can look at the commodity space and you can apply a little bit more innovative thinking and you can think about the future. And uh, that's really what my colleague Robert Robinson is going to be talking to us about. You can see he's um, one of the four senior members in our investment research team that really focuses on, on uh, the mega trend thinking. And Robert loves commodities. So we've, we've given him the responsibility uh, collectively, we've been working on this project for just close to a year, but Robert's been driving it. He's passionate about it. And um, so, Robert, with that as an introduction, um, welcome. Uh, you know, normally in a business, you keep the smart guys locked up in, in their, their offices and they punch the numbers and they do their work and they love their reading. So we're putting Robert on the on the block today. This is his first webinar. So Robert, good luck and uh, thank you for presenting to us. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. I hope I, I live up to it. Uh, let me just get my screen going. All right. So, so you, thanks to all the previous speakers, it's laid the, the groundwork for me but uh, you have eaten up a bit of my, my talking time, so I'm gonna have to do some fancy footwork to get through everything I'd like to say. Um, I do think the presentation is quite um, intuitive, so if, if I don't touch on everything, you can just go back and have a look at it. But from the outset, when we started work on the commodity portfolio, uh, we knew we were going to have to reimagine the human infrastructure and energy infrastructure in such a way to enhance 
traditional commodity offering with commodities focused on the future. And another key component of this would be to, in accordance to the global development goals set out by the various countries globally, we will also have to shift away from traditional commodities and allocate even more to future commodities. And that's just an entry point for us to, to manage the present with an eye on the future. Just before I go on, everyone is, you can still hear me. Yes, perfect, thank you. Okay, thanks. All right, so I'm gonna skip over to portfolio construction and then I'll, I'll head back and touch on those topics. So this is um, this slide has been has been doing the rounds, but the key the key component of this slide that we'd like to reiterate is like the both of the two speakers said before is that grey bar. Now the grey bar is fossil fuels, and the reason they are that big is because of global oil production and oil trade and other fossil fuels, it's such a big component to the global economy that it gets weighted accordingly in these indices. And when we started with our portfolio construction, we, we chose the Bloomberg Commodity Index because it is a more diversified index because it upweights um, in favor of liquid assets as opposed to trade volume and then it also implements limitations on the main categories and on singles, single commodities. So the way we, we started was by making an allocation of 50% to a traditional commodity index and then supplementing that allocation with a 50% allocation to future commodities. And then we, we end up with the Grace One Commodity Portfolio, which is 50 old, 50 new. So this, is, this diagram just visually illustrates that for your convenience. So in the top bar, we are combining the traditional and future commodities. And then at the bottom, um, if we focus on energy infrastructure, we have brought in um, clean energy generation and clean energy storage to supplement the existing traditional energy sector, which is dominated by fossil fuels. We brought in uh, metals for change, and these metals are, as um, Niels also alluded to, they are very much focused on energy generation and storage, all those aluminium, lithiums. But we, we will get back to those once we get past this. Then when we move over more to human infrastructure, we've brought in sustainable food and agricultural technologies to supplement the existing sectors of grain, livestock, and soft commodities. And we brought in two new additions, cannabis, and arguably the most important commodity of them all, water. So when we actually combine these two portfolios we've built, the, the bar in the middle is what we end up with. And the key takeaways on this slide is just to, to notice how the energy exposure has reduced by half moving from traditional to this combination portfolio we've built and we've supplemented energy with clean energy generation and storage. Also brought in responsive to change metals and with the addition of sustainable food, water, and cannabis, we've also brought down that exposure to grain and the bad connectations connected to livestock and global methane. And so forth. So just, just onto the next slide, I, I put this slide in just to reiterate that the 50-50 starting point is just an entry point into the market. And we are also migrating with the sustainable goals to a target of being 100% invested in future commodities. So 
as new commodities and new technologies come online, we will be allocating to them and taking away from traditional commodities. Here we just have a, a snapshot of how, how our current portfolio looks, where we have 70% of the portfolio is generating exposure to commodities via physical and future, future contracts. Uh, there is a, uh, for those who have questions on this, there, there is a slide we will get, we'll get back to on, on the different ways of gaining exposure to commodities. The other 30% is generated by equities. Now these, these we use in cases where we cannot use the commodity, so we use the equity to gain exposure to the underlying commodity. On the right hand side is just a current look at how our top 10 holdings look. Okay, so now I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump up a bit to the slides I've missed. Um, so just what, what are the traditional commodities I, I refer to? And those will be energies, grains, industrial metals, precious metals, livestock and softs. You're more than welcome to the slides will be sent to you, so you're more than welcome to head back to those slides and have a look. But I'm going to spend some time rather on, on this slide. So fortunately for me, uh, Nielsen Duncan has done quite a bit of talking regarding clean energy generation and clean energy storage. We have the various metals that go into these technologies, including electric cars. So that, that covers the, the, the first three of the categories we've identified. Then uh, the fourth category is sustainable food and agriculture. Now this can be, this can be split into two parts. Um, precision uh, fermentation, or as the scientists call it, just PF, or precision agriculture. Now precision agriculture, is the disruption, the disruption side of the market that focuses on um, extracting more yield, more revenue, more profit from an existing piece of land. So that's all the technology going into existing farming. And on the other side, we have the technology of um, precision fermentation, which is, let me just double check this, which is the, the the technology that allows us to program microorganisms to produce almost any complex molecule. Now, the most complex molecule we, we all use on a daily basis is protein. So then to drill down into the disruption provided by this, um, this technology, I've put it into two buckets. We have the what we eat and the way we eat bucket. So on the left-hand side, here in the middle of the page, you can see um, the first disruption will come from um, substitution of ingredients. Now, this is a business to business disruption and doesn't really consult the customer. So to give you the best way to explain it is to give you an example of if you recall Niels's graph, back in the 70s, there was a commodity spike in commodity prices. Among those was sugar. And a company called Coca-Cola had to adapt to, to the higher prices of refined sugar. And they moved over to high fructose corn syrup to, to mitigate their, their products prices not going too high and losing market share. And by 1978, sorry, um, they've completely moved to, to corn syrup. And by 1958, all soft drinks bottled in the US were using uh, corn syrup. The second, the second one on the list is uh, sub, um, substitution of the, the end product. And this is more a business to customer substitution where we, where the customer is demanding maybe a product that is, has less animal, animal parts to it or more healthy keto 
all kinds of uh, consumer queries that needs to be addressed. And a, a good example to, it would be um, Impossible Foods, which developed the Impossible Burger that you've probably heard about. So they've used the technology to create a, to replicate ground beef in a way that plant-based and non-PF technologies just couldn't do. Then when we move over to the right-hand side and the way we consume to, um, food, we have the fortification. Now, an easy way to think of fortification is, is a protein bar with extra added protein that is done, that is put in via technology. And another example of that um, would be a company in a startup company in the US called Halo Top, which developed the ice cream that has double the amount of protein a, a normal ice cream would have. And they have since they have since grown to a company generating four million a year in turnover. Not bad for a for our ice cream business. And then the last. The last disruption is in terms of, of form factors. So when I say form factors, what I'm referring to is a complete change in the of the form we are taking in these um, sustainable foods. Uh, uh, so there's, it, the way to think about it would possibly be, it, it, we, we started with a protein bar which is, was fortified with, with protein. And next we will be moving to a, a personalized nutritional bar. And in the not too distant future, we will be having, cap, we'll be taking in these um, foodstuffs as capsules, taking a keto pill in the morning to give you your, all your needs on that. Um, so, just to get back, um, so this is all the disruption just happening in this part of, of our portfolio, which is the sustainable food part. Um, please go ahead and, and read up more on, our, on the various topics, and you can also contact me directly if you want to go into more detail on any of these. But I think I'm, I'm starting to run low on time, and we would also like to... Uh, to get to any questions. Um, thank you for the presentation. Quite amazing to think that you can now have a, a plant-based burger and a healthy ice cream. Uh, if you recall that one slide where I showed that, that that filter process of ours, I mean, typically we don't invest in, in funds or ETFs that's got less than a three-year track record, but, you know, we found certain funds and managers that's been around for a year or two we have actually allocated because they're the guys that are investing in this new thinking such as ice creams and burgers um, what i'd like to do bailey if in the background you can bring up um, our poll questions and then i see there's also a few questions for niels and for our panelists which nandi can then handle but if you can all see the poll you can all participate the first polling question do you think it is possible to yield superior returns from investing in a greener economy? Solar, wind, um, you know, all the new type school energy, so yes, no, or are not sure. And the second question, do commodities have an important role to play in any diversified investment portfolio? And I think if we asked that second question, you know, maybe five, six, seven, eight, nine years ago, maybe we would have got um, and not sure or a no, because for the last 10, 12 years, commodities have only been going down uh, before we've seen this big, strong rebound. Let's look at the answers. So in the first one, 80% says yes. Um, only one participant, no. And um, so it's a little bit of convincing we need to do there and um, unsure. So we have to do um, some more um, research and to empower you to make those decisions and do commodities have an important role to play? Yeah, 93%. And I think especially with this topical issue of where inflation is going, do we have a commodity super cycle? You know, what is the importance of old school gold, oil type commodities going forward? 
uh, I think most of you, like you saw in the poll, realize that it's got a place. So with that, Nanda, if you want to maybe host um, a few questions from our, from our guests, and then we can conclude. Certainly. Thank you so much, gentlemen, once again, for a very informative, powerful session today. We have specific questions for Neil. Snails, do you think that the Fed is correct in their view that inflation is transitory and if they are wrong, how would this potential impact commodities? <laughs> That's a very good question. A question I spend a lot of time on. Um, I probably disagree with the Fed um, when I say probably is because it's not it's it's not a black and white situation. It's not a situation you can definitely say yeah they're right or wrong, but the odds. In my book, at least, the odds favor the outcome that they're wrong. In other words, inflation will turn out to be a bigger problem than, um, than the Fed uh, likes to think it is, uh, and will therefore have to take more drastic action on interest rates than they are. Indeed. At the moment, uh, the markets suggest that you won't really see any meaningful increase in interest rates until 2023. Um, and my guess is that sometime in 2022, i.e. next year, um, there will be, uh, the Fed will have to turn around and say, yeah, we got it wrong. We need, to, we need to act more drastically. And that should definitely favor commodity prices. As I said earlier in my presentation, commodity prices, commodities, one of the best hedges you can find against rising inflation. How much inflation will rise? Who knows? Uh, but my guess is the, also you have to distinguish between the US and Europe. Um, and the reason you have to distinguish is because of the output gap. The output gap is much smaller in Europe, in the uh, US than it is in Europe. In other words, uh, there will be pressure on uh, resources in the US much, much earlier than it will happen in Europe. Therefore, I don't think inflation is going to be a massive problem in Europe. It will take up a little bit, uh, but I think the Americans have a problem, yes. Thank you for that, Niels. I think this one, Robert, you can take and then we'll call it a day. It's in the coming month or year, what future commodity will you be adding to the portfolio next? Do you have a view? Yeah, so thank you for the question. So what we, what we, are, what we are busy working with um, is carbon credits. So definitely the next addition to our portfolio would be an allocation to carbon credits, which is um, one of the ways uh, simplified, one of the ways uh, commodities uh, um, companies do trade in carbon credits is by investing in green initiatives. Those green initiatives can provide carbon credits to the companies to offset their emissions. So. That is a very big industry. China has in the last two weeks rolled out their voluntary carbon trading system and it's gonna just take off from there. So carbon credits will be the next focus point for our portfolio. Can I, can I just add to what Robert just said, uh, just to give our audience an, a, a view of how widespread this uh, whole discussion around carbon credits and carbon dioxide is. Uh, scientists in Denmark have now found that combining carbon dioxide with certain bacteria, they can create the uh, protein. In other words, they can turn carbon dioxide from a liability into a big, big assets in a, in a, growing, in a, in a world where demand for protein is rising and rising and rising. As, 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 as I think it was, I can't remember if it was Duncan or Robert who said in their presentation that about 70% of all water is used by the agricultural industry. I can tell you the biggest user of water in the agricultural industry is cattle farmers. Cattle farmers use a huge amount of water. And if we can find a way to create protein other than through uh, through meat, um, we will have fixed one of the biggest problems that we're facing in this world. 
hundred percent. Yeah. Well, thank you, gentlemen, and thank you so much to all who attended the webinar today. I'd like to remind you that Neil's book is available if you can just answer the question that Duncan asked of which year did he found the company ARP. So if you have the answer, you know the answer. We've said it a couple of times now, or if you're not sure, you can go to the website on his website and then email me at nande at gracewinder.co.za. Thank you for your time. We will be sending out the presentation. Yes, Neil. And uh, I, I'm just trying to get people to participate in this competition because according to my wife, there's no better sleeping pill in the world than my book. <laughs> not at all, not at all. The first time I took a hold of your book, I knew nothing about investments. And I tell you, I did go past at least three chapters, Neil. So this is a great <laughs> book to, to have as a potential investor. Thank you so much. And well, there you have it. It's a good book to have, whether you're interested or you just want a good night's read. We will be sending the presentation slides. There's a lot to chew on and to think about. We'll be sending them on to you together with the recording of this presentation. Thank you. We'll see you next time.